Well, hello, boys and girls. As uh, we have celebrated Easter this weekend, and uh, you're going to be needing to access your chapters 14 to 17 study guide. I've shared that with you in your Google Classroom account. You should be able to pull that up. Uh, I want to also introduce my helper here today, uh, who's going to be assisting me. There she is right there. She's going to help uh, be my audience here and be a lecture. That's her name is Sky. So she'll be uh, attending, sitting in our classroom also. So let's get started here, looking at chapter 14 through 70. Now, you looked at some of the stuff the other day in the assignment where I asked you to look at these inventors and tell me what they did. But we're going to go ahead and go through them again just to make sure uh, you have the correct information down on what they're noted for. Uh, the early part of the 19th century saw a huge wave of innovation and in technology. You think about this that for thousands of years, there was only a couple of ways to get around. I walked somewhere, I used a beast to ride on to haul me there, or I used a boat and either manpower oared me there or wind filled a sail and got me there. And that's, that's how I, I transported and that's how I traveled. Yet in the past 200 years, you've had huge uh, technological innovations in travel, uh, just even in my lifetime. Uh, nobody had been in space when I was born. And then when I was nine, we put a man on the moon. You can fly half, you can get on a plane here in Dallas and fly to Australia nonstop or the Middle East, Dubai nonstop. Uh, a plane can stay up in the air 15, 16 hours. It's just unheard of uh, that the things that have happened. And imagine moving forward in your lifetime, things that are going to happen, they're going to change the world for you. And these guys here, uh, things that they invented changed the world. So let's look at our first one there on the ground. That was Eli Whitney. He did a couple of things. Uh, what he's most noted for, obviously, that you've looked at is the invention of the cotton gin. Prior to the invention of the cotton gin, a slave who harvested cotton, a productive slave could harvest a pound of cotton a day. I mean, and I don't know if you've ever picked cotton or not. It's pretty rough because uh, cotton sits in a thorny, a thorny bush like this. When you go to reach it, people are cutting their fingers all the time at doing that. If you've ever done that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But cotton also has seeds in it, so you have to separate the seed out of the cotton, and that was painstaking and time-consuming. Uh, but again, a productive slave could produce a pound of cotton, they pick it, and then uh, get the get the seed out of it. Now, what the cotton gin did is it speeded up that process. The original cotton gin was a handheld crank that could separate the seed uh, from the cotton itself, and it could do 12 pounds a day. So now you're looking at being able to harvest the cotton and do 12 times as much, which means that I can plant 12 times as much because as we've discussed before, cotton is a perishable product. And there was a huge demand for cotton in English textile mills. And it was a very lucrative trade uh, for Southern cotton producers. Uh, and so it, that cotton just exploded and cotton became king as a result of Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. And another thing he did was he came up with a concept of interchangeable parts uh, a lot of weapons were uh, handmade, and you had a specific barrel, you had a specific hammer, a specific trigger, because uh, it was handmade to that. But if the trigger the hammer broke or something broke on the gun, the gun became useless because it, it had been handmade. Where what Eli Whitney did is we're going to make all identical parts. We're going to make all trigger guards the same, all triggers the same, all barrels the same length, uh, with the same caliber, all uh, hammers, all the parts of the guns that were. Uh, were all made exactly the same. So if something broke on the weapon, you could, you could replace it. And he'll sign one of the first contracts with the United States Army where he'll sell 10,000 guns to, uh, to to the U.S. Army along with the extra parts so that the weapons can be used a long time. Our next fellow there is Samuel Slater. Samuel Slater had been born in England and he had a photographic memory and he worked early on in English textile mills. Uh, and he's gonna immigrate to the United States and when he um, when he when he grows when he as he grows up he's he from memory is going to reconstruct and rebuild a textile mill. So if you look in there, it's the second one. He's known as the um, father of the American Industrial Revolution uh, because uh, because of his memory and being able to produce uh, with these textile mills. He's going to be seen as a traitor <clears throat> in England for having brought these uh, technical all oh, these uh, industrial secrets here to the United States uh, to compete with England. Our next fellow on the list there, Robert Fulton, he's gonna be a guy that's gonna revolutionize transportation. 
again, as I mentioned early on, the only way uh, water-wise to get around was somebody that oared you there. You had people in the galleys rowing the boat, or you had sails that were dependent on wind to fill them up with wind, and and the wind and the wind pushed you along. Uh, it was easy going downstream of the river because you had you had the current working with you. However, it took a long time to go upriver. Case in point, the Lewis and Clark expedition when when they went up the Missouri River, they might make three to five and and on a good day, eight miles a day, because they were literally pulling the boat up the river as they up to Missouri as they went. On their return trip, though, because they were going with the current in 1806, they were making 60 and 70 miles a day in their boats that came back. What Robert Fulton did was he came, invented the first steamboat. Uh, he called the steamboat the Claremont, and he's going to use steam to power an engine that's going to drive with paddles, move the boat upstream, and in 1807, his steamboat, the Claremont, is going to steam 25 miles up the Hudson River, right outside New York. And this completely revolutionizes uh, travel on waterways, where now I can go upstream as easily as I can come downstream. Uh, our next fellow there is Cyrus McCormick. He's going to invent what's known as the mechanical reaper. Uh, you go back to the story of Ruth uh, and Naomi in Scripture, she was a widow, and so what they were allowed to do as widows, they were allowed to come behind the people who had taken a, a sickle and hand cut the grains and pick up the loose grains. Well, this is the way it had been done for thousands of years, but now it's a mechanical reaper. You can actually have a machine go through and do at a much faster pace and a higher volume pace what it manpower used to have to do. Uh, you look at a combine today. Uh, combine is, is a, a descendant of the mechanical reaper, and it, uh, you can produce a lot more corn, wheat, uh, lots of things that otherwise would have had to been done by hand. Peter Cooper, uh, what Peter Cooper, he's on our sheet there, yes, is that right? Yes, Peter Cooper, right here. Peter is uh, going to use the idea of steam power uh, to come up and create a steam engine or the, the, the first train locomotive where you're going to use steam to move along tracks. Uh, this is going to be the forerunner of the railroad, and now where I used to have a half a wagon to drag uh, across the mountain, now I can use steam power and an engine to pull, and these early trains can go as fast as 30 miles an hour. You consider that the normal human being walks about three miles an hour, and maybe in a wagon I can go six to seven miles an hour. Now, now traveling in a train, I can go 30 miles an hour, and it's going to eventually pick up speed as technology develops, where by 1870, with the first transit, well, the first transcontinental railroad was going to be completed in 1869. Uh, but now, by 1870, I can board a train in New York and be on the west coast of the United States. I can go from New York to California in five to six days, uh, taking trains where before that was a trip that if you took it by boat was six weeks around the tip of South America or eight months to a year uh, overland. Uh, by wagon train or that it just and so now the world is becoming a much much smaller place thanks to these inventions our next fellow there is john deere yeah you've heard of him he's still around he, he's the inventor of the modern tractor uh you see all that you see his equipment everywhere uh but one of the things that where he changed for agriculture was the invention of the steel plow prior to john deere and the use of steel plows you had wooden plows and wooden plows go all the way back again thousands of years and the problem with wood is if you hit a rock or you hit soil that it couldn't punch through, then the plow could break. Uh, and then, you, you, then you're then you stuck and have to go hand make another plow. Now with the steel plow, the steel plow can cut through dirt. It can uh, break a rock or move a rock that otherwise would have been have broken on a uh, on a wooden plow. And so now, now farming is able to advance because they're able to uh, till more land and plant more. Uh, our next flyer there, Elias Howe. Elias Howe is uh, going to invent the sewing machine. Uh, as opposed to where North, but prior to this, I had to stitch things by hand and make things by hand. The sewing machine is going to speed up that process. I think that's kind of a lost art now that used to be taught in home economics when I was a young lad. And you got to watch my mother and I watched my grandmother use the old Singer sewing machines. Uh, but it's going to it's going to speed up the ability to take these textiles that are being produced in these mills to now uh, make more and more cloth, more and more. Uh, Clothing for people. Samuel Morse, our next individual in there, he's, uh, uh, he's going to change communication. 
when George Washington gave his inaugural address in 70, <clears throat> excuse me, 1789 in New York, it took eight weeks for a copy of his address to get from New York City to Mount Vernon at his home in Virginia, a copy of his speech. Uh, because of communication, you just had to print it and then take it overland. Now, when Andrew Jackson, just 30 years later, gave his inaugural address in 1829, actually that'd be 40 years, 40 years later, because of what Samuel Morse did, he invented the Morse code, which you could use dashes and dots to communicate up and down a telegraph line. And you had people that understood what the dashes and the dots meant. And they could they could uh, then translate it and you could get a message uh, very quickly. So case in point, when um, Andrew Jackson gave his inaugural address in 1829 in Washington, D.C., a copy of his inaugural address was in Boston newspapers eight hours later. So just in 40 years, he'd gone from weeks to hours in communication. Morse code's still around, it's still used. Uh, the Navy uses it, Naval Aviators use Morse code. Uh, and there was an interesting uh, side note with this in World War II is that the Germans knew, in World War II, the Germans knew that the Allies were set to invade uh, along in France somewhere along the coast, but the Germans weren't sure where it was. Uh, what the Allies wanted to do, though, is they wanted to let the French resistance and the French underground in France know that the invasion was imminent and therefore that was going to happen within 24 hours and to go out and start doing whatever they could do to disrupt German German uh, military capabilities, like blowing up rails, taking out power lines, sabotage, anything like that. But how do you let the French know that it's coming, the invasion is going to happen within 24 hours, but not tip the Germans off? They used Morse code. Um, again, I told you there's a series of dashes and dots. So, for example, if I went dot, 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 dash in Morse code, that's the letter V. So, again, dot, 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 dash, letter V. And this was a symbol that Churchill always used, Fever Victory. And uh, in France, it was known as Vitra. Uh, but this was the key to the code. They were going to use Morse code to uh, signal the French underground that the invasion uh, the evasion of France was going to be happening within 24 hours. But how do you do that? They use Morse code, but they use music. For you Baroque masters out there and you classical people that like classical music, if you've ever heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know how it starts. I was there with da 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 And if you've ever heard that song, that's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But if you listen to the four notes, da 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 dot, 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 dash, V. And they, so they played Beethoven's Fifth Symphony on June 5th over and over again to let the French know the invasion was going to happen within 24 hours, which it did on the morning of June 6th, 1944. But it set in motion uh, the French underground, the French resistance. Interesting story with the Morse code, in my opinion. Cyrus Field, the next guy that you see there. Again, revolutionizing communication. Uh, you uh, can get on your phone now, if you and you can talk to anybody in the world. You can FaceTime people. You can... Uh, for a fee, talk to somebody on the other side of the world live. Uh, when I was your age in high school, if you were going to call somebody back home, if you were overseas and you called back to the United States, first of all, you had to get an international operator and give them all the, the country code, the area code, and give them all that information. And they put you on hold while they try to get a hold of somebody over here and make that call. And when you did, it was anywhere from 2 to $3 a minute you know, to talk to somebody overseas like that. Now, with satellite technology, you can get on your phone, you can FaceTime people from the other side of the world. But again, communicating with Europe or getting any information back from them took months because you had to use water transportation boats to get messages back and forth. What he did though, was he came up with the idea of laying a transatlantic cable uh, from uh, England all the way to the United States. And that's what they did. The cable still lies on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. But imagine that you're talking with some of these canyons and mountains underneath the ocean there. Uh, and you're talking about 3,000 miles of one connected cable, and they're able to do that. And he's going to be able to uh, do that and lay that cable. And the, so now instead of having to wait, instead of having to wait months to get information, it was just a matter of hours, where now the world is becoming a much, much smaller place. Look at the world you live in right now. You get you get instant information on, um, on anything that's happening. Anything that's happening in the world right now, you're, it's on TV. You, you're gonna you, you see it. You see it instantly. Okay, that finishes page one. Let's go to the next page here. Let's see what we have here. 
it's the one with the second great awakening yeah, that page right there uh, you know, the lighting yeah the second great awakening and charles grant is many so let's let's go to that page there and take it take a look at that um if you if you remember the first great awakening that took place in the 1730s and 40s it was a thing where church attendance had dropped dramatically uh, from 1630 to 1730, where you had an almost 80% reduction from nine out of 10 people attending church on a regular basis to just one out of 10 attending church on a regular basis. And then you had this revival that swept through the country. Same thing. So then you had this revival. You have, again, we've talked about that, the Christian principles that were instilled in our founding fathers, uh, that there were kids during this awakening, and these values were instilled in them. And now, as they've gotten older, uh, they're at the prime of their life in their 30s and 40s and 50s, framing our government, but under the guise of the revival and the Christian principles that they had been raised with. In the 1830s and the 1840s, you're going to have another awakening here in this country. And the father of the second great awakening that you see there is Charles Grandison Finney. So if you looked at the topic of the second great awakening, you'd want to have on there a revival that occurred here in the United States in the 1830s and 40s, uh, where a lot of people who had just become numb to their spiritual faith or had become numb to scripture. Now they have an awakening or a revival within themselves and they, and they turn back to God. Uh, we might be experiencing something like that right now in our country where there's a lot of people that are, have become very spiritual over this uh, as they, and they have a chance to maybe reflect on their lives. Your lives have been changed. You're sitting there at home and spending, there are more and more people spending time with their family, which is great having that time to focus and get back together because we get so busy with life that we forget. And that's the, that was the origins of the first two. People weren't necessarily, we're going to go be evil. They just get too busy. They get so busy that they go, eh, I don't have time for that. And you just, uh, a week goes by, two weeks goes by, a month goes by, six months goes by, and you're not attending a church service uh, or you're not in the word. And it just, it, it's easy just to let it, let it slide. That's in that old, uh, in that old hymn, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I mean, we're in there. But uh, I really believe, that, as I've uh, shared with you, I believe with other scriptures, that uh, God's trying to awaken this land. Uh, there's lots of good people in this land. And uh, I think this is a, an opportunity for you to have a revival or awakening this country. But back in the 19th century, you had, again, look at the second topic there. He was uh, Charles Grandison Finney. Right, he was known as the leader of the Second Great Awakening. He was a great evangelist, uh, and he was a great he was a great orator. He uh, had been a Presbyterian minister who embraces the concept of abolition. Now, uh, if you remember what abolition is, abolition is that there was a group and it started up in Boston, up in the Northeast. But they said we want to do away with the institution of slavery. That slavery is morally wrong and reprehensible. Uh, he's going to go on to become president. If you look down your sheet there, go down to the bottom there you'll see Oberlin College. So you can tie Charles Grandison Finney to this, to Oberlin College. He's going to become the president of Oberlin College in a later age. So go ahead and jump down to Oberlin College. We can look at that. This was the first college and it opened up in Ohio and it was specifically for women. Remember, it was at that time, it was not considered important. It was not considered priority or important to educate females. So they don't need to be educated. It was only the men that need to be educated. Uh, but he he disagreed and said women need to be educated also. So Oberlin College was initially open specifically for women, but it's going to expand uh, that it's going to be a college for everything and even minorities, which was unheard of back then. You, don't, you do not educate minorities. They don't need to be educated. Uh, but he's going to say that no, all men, need to be, all men, women of all races need to have access to education. Uh, your next topic there, Puritans versus Protestant liturgy. And remember what the term liturgy is. Liturgy is basically how a denomination worships. We've touched on this before. Uh, a Catholic does not worship the same as a Baptist. The Methodist will worship different than a Lutheran. They all, in the end, have the same creed. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he's the way to salvation. All liturgy is is how when I go into my house of worship, how I choose to how I choose to practice and how I, want, how I want to worship. But you had people that were very opinionated. Again, the two things you really don't want to talk about the Thanksgiving table, politics and religion, because people get very passionate about those things. And there was a, the Puritan way of belief was that there was only one way to do it. If you deviated from that, 
then you were then you were wrong. It's ironic that Puritans came to America to, to escape the persecution in England uh, because of their Puritan beliefs within the Church of England. Yet when they get here, within just a matter of years, they're imposing their will on other people, saying, "No, no, 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 no. This this is the only way to worship." And so you had Puritans again who believed in <clears throat> they believed in the in the concept of predestination. Uh, where the Protestant faith had, as it started to expand, said, no, there's free will, and that you, <clears throat> you as an individual have the right to come to Jesus freely and get that and get that salvation. So there was that embrace there. You're going to have, uh, let's look at our next topic there, Southern Baptists and Methodists. So you have the Methodist Church and you have the Baptist Church here in the United States, yet the Baptist Church... Uh, and the Methodist Church up north preached uh, preached to God that the, the, the slavery is wrong. Where down south, Baptist and Methodist churches said, no, slavery is not wrong. It's it's a normal institution. And they had a biblical justification for that slavery. Uh, they said, even going back to the, uh, the Garden of Eden, there was one party that was subordinate to the other, meaning there was Adam, and then there was Eve, who was created as a helpmate to help Adam, who was the overseer <clears throat> of all things there in the garden. Uh, other justifications were is that uh, Jesus is silent on the issue of uh, slavery. He doesn't say anything about it, pro or con. The Apostle Paul, uh, they said, hey, the scripture says, slaves obey your masters. Uh, the book of Philemon is about a runaway slave. Paul says, you need to go back. You need to go back to your master. You've run away. In other words, you, he, you being owned by him, you've stolen from him by, <clears throat> by running away. So the people of 200 years ago, living in the South that were Baptist and Methodist, like, we're not doing anything wrong. And so Northern Methodist bishops tried to tell Southern Methodist bishops what to do. Uh, the Baptist Association uh, tried to tell the South what to do, but the South said, you know what? We're not going to do that. And so they will split. They will split off during this time. Uh, and over 300 Baptist churches in the South will split, and they'll form their own association. You might have heard of it, because I was raised in it, the Southern Baptist Association. Obviously, now the Southern Baptist Church doesn't advocate slavery, but that was the origins of the name uh, of Southern Baptist. So uh, let's see. Our next topic there, Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Uh, Joseph Smith was a guy. He's the founder of the modern-day Mormon church. He's going to believe that an angel called named Moroni, that's like M-O-R-O-N-I, is going to come to him and tell him of a of these golden tablets that he has that has a foreign language on them that can only be read with special glasses. So Joseph Smith, with the direction of this angel, would take these glasses and put them on and look at these golden tablets in a, in a hat. He could look down at them. And he told us it was a story of, an, of a group of people that came here to the Americas and that Jesus actually came here to the Americas during his 40 days post resurrection before he ascended to heaven and ministered here and that you had a remnant from Israel leave and come here to the Americas because everything had become corrupt. <clears throat> he's going to convince, uh, he's going to convince one of the wealthy men in town to help him translate this book. And so Joseph Smith will look into the hat and read the golden tablet with these, with these, uh, with these glasses on while this other guy over here transcribes and writes down everything that Joseph Smith is saying. It's what we know today is the Book of Mormon. Uh, that That's uh, that's what they use. And so in the end, because I've had Mormons come and knock on my door, they'll have a Bible with them, and, but they'll also have the Book of Mormon. And all you have to do is make the conversation very short and say, okay, I, I, get what you, I, I see what you're trying to do, but which book is more important? Which book do you put stock in? Do you, is the Bible, if you could only take one of these, which one would you take? And they will always say, well, give me the Book of Mormon. So you got you got them right there uh, on that. That's that's what they believe. Well, uh, this guy's wife, who was the wealthy guy in town, uh, he was giving Joseph Smith money, and his wife's like, "I think this guy's a charlatan. He's uh, he's trying to scam you." He said, "No, no, 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 no. He's he's reading. He's reading tablets. He's looking at them." Wife, the wife didn't buy the story. She said, "Here's what you do. You go back and you tell Joseph Smith that you lost. You lost." You know, the, the papers that you transcribed the Book of Mormon on, and then if he's telling the truth, he should be able to look back into that hat with those glasses and tell you the exact same story word for word that he told you the first time. And if you can do that, then maybe I'll listen to it. Well, when he went back to Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith was like, 
Uh, the angel took the tablets. Look, I don't have them anymore. Uh, he'll get run out. Some people will follow him. People always do. He'll get run out of town. Uh, he'll move to Illinois where, long story short, in the end, he'll be, he'll be killed in Illinois. And his second commander, a guy named Brigham Young, will take the Mormons who have followed his faith, and they're going to go to someplace. They said, we just want to get way far away. And they're going to go to a remote area uh, called the Great Salt Lake in Utah there where they're going to start the Mormon church. And that's where they are today, is Salt Lake City. That's the seat of the, of the Mormon church. Brigham Young University, uh, just about 40 miles south of Salt Lake City in a town called Provo, Utah. Uh, Brigham Young is also going to have another note of fame is that Brigham Young is, I believe, three, is the great, great, great grandfather of Super Bowl 29 MVP Steve Young. You may have seen Steve Young on, in, on the NFL Network, uh, but he was quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. But he played at Brigham Young University. He was a phenomenal quarterback. But, yeah, Steve Young today is the director of Brigham Young. Uh, Horace Mann, the next topic that you see there, is uh, he's a guy, he's the father of what we call today our modern public education system. He believed that every, that it was the responsibility of the government that every boy and girl should be educated uh, to be able to write mathematics, science, and that it should go to a high level. So he's the father of our modern system that we have today, where you have a public education system funded by taxpayers. And that now it's, it's law. Everybody's got to go. You don't go to school or you don't have some kind of certification that you're going to school. They're going to come looking for you. Uh, they're going to find you. So you, by law, you have, as a parent, you have to send your kids to school, either homeschool and show the certification and accreditation, private school, which is where you're at, which is certified, or use the public education system or some type of online school that's also certified. But Horace Mann is the father of that because he said, if America is going to prosper, if Americans going to do well, you have to have an educated society. You can't have just a few educated and an illiterate group down here. If everybody's educated, the more educated we have, the more prosperous we're going to be. We've looked at Oberlin College there. Uh, let's look at Avery College there. And it was a, it was the first minority college that was open specifically for blacks. But it, it was initially open just for free blacks. But then when after the Civil War, when all were free, they, they were open to all. Uh, Black men, but it was initially designed for African Americans to come. Uh, Dorothea Dix is, uh, you looked at her, you did something on her a week or two ago about prison reform. She went into a prison and saw how the mentally ill were being treated and how the dispossessed and the criminals were treating the harsh conditions, and she broke her heart. She said, There's, Yeah, they may have done something wrong criminally, but they don't need to be dehumanized and beaten uh, like that. And they also said, she was also, why are we throwing the mentally ill in with criminals that just because they're mentally ill, they don't, this is not the place for them. So she's going to be a big advocate for mental health hospitals and uh, places where they can go and they can be treated. But she's also going to be a huge on prison reform that you have to, you have to treat, even, even though they have to be incarcerated, you have to treat people, you have to treat people humanely. Uh, and we'll do a discussion on that on prison, but the last thing there, well, actually, I'm going to hold off on that because that will take us into the transcendentalists, which we'll talk about next time. So there you go. Uh, that's 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 the end of our lecture. I want you to take a look down here at my helper. Look what I did to her. I put her to sleep. Yeah, she's now nah, her eyes cracked. She's listening, but uh, and she's she's had to endure my uh, endure these talks. So. I miss you guys. I hope all is well. Uh, again, I'll be on Zoom on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week. Uh, I'll get you the rest. Of, if you want to Zoom with me tomorrow, I'll have more of an, give you more of an idea of what the rest of this week looks like. But that's your assignment to tell you to watch this, fill out your uh, fill out your sheet as you go along because you'll need it when we do test over this. Okay. So all of you, blessings on you and your family. Miss you guys, and I want you to have a great day. And. Uh, We'll see you tomorrow if you Zoom with me.